Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, my guest is Luke. Luke from Marathon to Sobriety. You can find him on Instagram. That is also his website. Luke, how are you today? Hey, Matt. I'm doing great. Awesome. How are great you? Day. Yeah, dude, I'm really good. I fellow Canadian as well, worth mentioning. Very cool. Always cool to have another uh, Canadian that's doing uh, great things. And yeah, dude, I, uh, I've just I've been following your Instagram for a while. You know, I've been in the uh, the Instagram sober community for about a year now. And yeah, you definitely have a standout. Like I just, I love, I always like the combining of elements of something else with sober living and sober coaching. You know what I mean? Like when somebody takes, uh, like I just had um, this guy, Ben, Ben Tuff on, and he was doing like a swimming, like swimming really helped him with sobriety. And then mm. yours, and it's funny, his episode just came out today, whereas with yours is like, you know, a marathon running and such. So uh, really cool stuff. Uh, I just want to start by like letting, you know, the, the listeners know what you have going on. Cause you have a, a, you do some sober coach and all that. I want to let you give sort of an introduction of yourself, please. Yeah, absolutely. So listen, Matt, thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to to talk with you today. Um, so what am I doing today? I mean, I, I honestly feel that, um, I'm absolutely at my best, uh, at my best place that I've been in my life. You know, my life's not perfect. I still have my struggles and my days, or the, my my tough days for sure. But I feel overall, in general, um, I've never had more clarity. I've never been more excited about life. I've never been more proud of myself. Um, you know, I've been through a lot. Um, you know, I have a three and a half year old daughter who never met drunk daddy. I got sober before she was born, so that gives me a lot of joy to see her and and to see that she, you know she doesn't have to worry about her dad not showing up. Um, I'm in the best shape of my life. Um, I got, like you mentioned, I got, I, I got into running. I found another passion about two and a half years into my sobriety. So I run a lot. As you can see, I'm a little uh, red in the face. I literally just finished a 25 kilometer run. Wow. Um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I'm training for, I got a marathon, uh, May 7th, the Toronto marathon. That'll be my fourth marathon. So it's like running's become such a passion of mine. Um, it's helped me so much with my sobriety. I'm just, I'm just frankly, I'm a, a more calm, better person as a runner, as a sober runner, I should say. Yeah. Um, you know, I also, I'm doing um, recovery coaching, sober coaching. It's become a big passion of mine, helping people, you know, find their, you know, find their, find their way through this, uh, through this thing, right? Like finding their greater purpose, helping them, um, you know, with their new identity of being sober and what a sober life looks like to show them that, Hey, it's not a depressing thing to be sober. Um, Cause that's how we definitely, I started. I was, you know, my first few years, I was really struggling to find my identity. So I want to help people, you know, f kind of learning from, from my mistakes that I had. So I'm doing that. I'm doing running coaching as well. I feel like a lot of my clients that, um, that, that are coming to me are, into fitness of some sort, they can see that that's a big part of my my life and part of my recovery. So I help I help my clients you know, not only get and stay sober, but really try to find that new that new identity and to find a passion and and you know help them with with their you know fitness goals as well. So it's it's been it's been a lot of fun. It, it's been a lot of fun, but it's definitely been a been a journey. It's uh, you know I've been sober um, for just over six years. December thirty first, twenty sixteen. Wow. So it, it it's it's been a, a a bit, but you know I've I've had my ups and downs during that time. It it wasn't smooth sailing right from the beginning. So that's why it's, I'm so excited to to be talking to you, Matt, and just sharing a bit of my story. And you know my goal is always to just you know if I could if I could touch one or two people along the way, you know kind of like each day, every day I touch one or two people, like I've done my job, and it's just so fulfilling for me. And at the same time, it helps me a lot with my own sobriety and my own uh, struggles to feel like I'm giving back. So it's, it's really a great feeling. Yeah. That's, that's, thanks for sharing all of that, you know, and I do want to give you an opportunity to, to go into your story. It sounds very, uh, and congratulations, by the way, I'm six plus years. It's amazing stuff. Very inspiring. And I love how just honest you are, you know, the first couple of years was a challenge for you. And I will, I, I do want to get into that uh, before you do though. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm very intrigued how, you know, your own experiences, as you mentioned, a lot of times coaches can be at their best when they can share their own personal experiences. And like you say, you're, you're helping people not make the same mistakes you did. Right. So I'm kind of curious how that shows up. It's really interesting to me that you, uh, you know, found your purpose through running and now you're, that's a big part of the coaching that you do. Are, 
the specifically, are there people that are like, Hey, like is running for me and they try it. And then that's, if, if that's not for them, at least that leads them to something else that, that that's for them. Or what is the process for that? Cause for me is as soon as I, if I was to work with you, I'd be like, well, I'm going to try this running thing too. And then who knows how it would go. And then I'm, I'm sure it would at least put me on in the direction of like putting that out to the universe. Okay. What is my calling? So I'm just interested yeah. how that shows up for your community. I, I think the the first thing is that it's just about, you know, being open-minded and trying new things. I think, you know, to have, you know, a, a good, uh, you know, stretch and recovery, it's about, you know, finding, it's it's truly about self-discovery. Like the word sobriety for me still carries a big stigma. We know, uh, Matt, but it's like, that's what, that's what we're working towards. I feel like we all have the same goal to break that stigma. So instead of looking at it like, the word, you know, sobriety, it, it still, you know, doesn't have the greatest connotation. So I, I, I say things like self-discovery mm. um, as well as self-improvement. It's a self-improvement mm. journey. So when you're on a self-improvement journey, you're just trying to be better. Mm. You know, naturally you're going to try, you're going to try different things. You can't just continue doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. You need to try different things. So the answer isn't necessarily running. By, by no means is the answer running or by no means is the answer, uh, you know, lifting weights, but the answer is trying something different or maybe mm. doubling down on something you've been doing um, and that you that you enjoy. And that's the way I look at it. So the people that are coming to me that are reaching out that I'm, I'm working with, um, they have running um, either uh, background. They've been, they've always kind of ran casually. I have a few clients who are also, you know, pretty avid runners, like they're tr training to qualify for, you know, the Boston Marathon, big, big races. Wow. But, and I also have runners who are or clients who, who never really ran before. Um, so I have like alert, like a couch to 5k uh, or couch to 10k uh, approach mm -hmm. as well. It's very tailored mm -hmm. yeah. because, you know, yes, I've been running for a few years now and I've also learned the hard way. I've gotten injured early quick mm. in my running. I thought I needed to run, you know, fast every time and I got injured. So it's like, I've learned a lot from that. So it's, I want to give back and I want to show people to help them that if, if they wanted to get into running, it's not this intimidating sport because it can be, you know, uh, I want to help, you know, make them feel more comfortable and help them work towards their goals. Yeah, that makes sense. What is it specifically about running that did it for you? Like I've heard, you know, for swimming and running, there's some parallels in some senses, you know, it's like a sort of like a moving meditation, right? Like where there's just this clarity that you can clarity of mind, the positive self-talk, very linear as opposed to this periphery and fragmented thought patterns and such. What is it? What was it for you uh, that was that's so intriguing about running that's that brings you back? So I hated running actually, like growing up as a kid, like wow, I hated, okay. I absolutely despised running. I played a lot of sports, a lot of team sports, Okay, but I hated running. Hated wow. It. Interesting. Yeah. Right. And yeah. even in university after school, I hated running. Um, you know, I always was in the gym, played a lot of, like I said, you know, hockey and stuff like that. Um, and then it wasn't until about, you know, two and a half years into my sobriety where I was struggling a lot. I hadn't really changed much. I would just was not using. Mm. Um, a good friend of mine, my best friend, actually, he, he's into, um, like Ironman, like, like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like triathlons, yeah. like, you know, the swimming, the bike, the, the run, it's like pretty hardcore stuff. And he was like, Luke, you should, you should maybe get into like, try to try to run, like, see how you like it. So I, so I started running like kind of on my own and, uh, casually. And I was like, you know what, this, this kind of sucks still, but I, I kind of, it gives me the, this excuse to not do things on the night before on the weekend it's like mm. i can sit, tell people i have a, a run in the morning like i'm going to a run i have a group okay. run i'm doing something yeah. and it just just having that made me feel good and the other thing too is like yeah i was sober for two years but i kept saying to myself like luke so what you're sober for two years you're not using that's huge i mean good for you but like what else are you doing with your life like mm. i was doing the same things and I wasn't really growing or learning or doing anything different. It just wasn't using, which is a big step. But that's, in my opinion, that's the easy part. The easy part is not using. As, as hard as that is, that's the easy part. The other mm. part is like finding out more about yourself. What are things you like to do? Trying different things, you know, sucking at them, failing at them, feeling miserable, but getting back up and trying something different or, or taking a different approach. So running for me, you know, if I'm just looking back, it, it's it's really my way to connect my mind and body. Um, I really feel that 
there's such a connection between the two. And I really feel that I'm also my best as a runner. There's something about, you know, um, getting my, my endorphins, my, you know, my, my dopamine hit because mm. that cheap dopamine that I've been using for years, right. The alcohol and drugs that, that stuff, that stuff is just prolonging the inevitable, you know, it's just pushing, it's just delaying things, but this mm. natural high that I get from running, it, it's a real thing. Runner's high. It's, it's yeah. a real thing. And I absolutely love it. And, um, it, and it's, and it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's made me a more calm person. I do a lot of processing when I'm running, I run with my music, no phone. So I have no distractions. Mm. I, I reflect on my day, what's coming yeah. up. And I feel like it's my therapy. Honestly, running has become my therapy. Mm. So that's su super cool. I love how casual you were about like 25 kilometers before we started. I know you're out East, right? So you're on, uh, are you on Eastern time? Yeah. Eastern time. Okay. In so it was yeah. about noon. So, okay. Yeah, man. Cause like, <laughs> I, the most I've done, I have done one run that was like 22 and a half kilometers. That's far. Uh, yeah, I was, I was quite proud of myself. But it, meanwhile, you're casually just doing it as your morning run, which is hilarious. So, But I just want to be clear, though. Like, I, I work my ass off at my running. Like, like yeah. I, it's become like a big passion of mine. Okay. And, and I, it, like I, it took me years to get to this point. Like, okay. I definitely wasn't doing it at the beginning. Sure. You know, sure. I was doing a lot of walk runs and, and that okay. kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's cool. Don't get, um, you know, intimidated by, in. by those yeah. long runs. It's people yeah. who've been running those distances have been running for a long, long time, long, long time. Right. Yeah, yeah. for sure. That's awesome. Well, you know what I want to, uh, you know, we've, we've had a few hints of, of your past, you know, you mentioned that that first, uh, couple of years in sobriety was very challenging. I want to go back or give you the opportunity to go back even further if you care to, and just, yeah, a little bit about your backstory, your upbringing, you know, your origins with alcohol, your relationship, your drinking career, as we call it sometimes, mm -hmm. just what led you into that sobriety in the first place. So the floor is yours and take whatever time you, uh, yeah. whatever you'd like to do. Yeah. I mean, so one thing I always want to make clear is that my drinking was, um, was, I was very much, um, like a people pleaser. Mm. I always say I'm a recovering people pleaser. And where I was triggered the most was in social situations. So like parties, events, um, that, that kind of stuff, because like I had a lot of social anxiety. That's where I struggled the most. Mm. So that's when I drank the most is, is socially. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of going back a little bit, you know, I'm half Italian, half French Canadian. So my parents, you know, were very social. Like my dad was from Italy, pretty, um, you know, loved to entertain uh, my mom, French Canadian you know, loved also a lot of friends, entertaining people coming over for dinner, you know, wine, like a lot of wine at dinner, celebrating life, like very, very like fun, like a, like a fun family. Like we did a lot of fun things. So I was exposed to it at a pretty young age. Um, in fact, my, my, my nono, which is my Italian grandfather on my dad's side, he used to make wine in the basement, like typical, you know, European uh, men, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Italian men love making wine. So he made wine in the basement. There was tons of barrels and barrels of wine in the basement. And I was drinking wine, uh, probably at 10 years old at the dinner table with my family. That's just what we did. Like very controlled, right? Like it would be like, you know, a, a little bit of uh, what we called Nono's Coke, which was a little bit of wine, a little bit of ginger ale, kind of like 50, 50. So mm -hmm. watered down wine with ginger, uh, ginger ale. So that's what we had. So, you know, I was, I was grew up in that kind of environment. Um, and not, nothing crazy, nothing crazy at all. You know, two loving parents, a brother, like a really great family, like, all, like tons of opportunities, play a lot of sports, a lot of friends, like no real, you know, no real reason really to to, to really drink a lot or, or anything that I was felt like I was escaping. Um, but, you know, when I was trying to find myself in, um, or high school, you know, you're trying to fit in. So parties, regular stuff. Um, I wouldn't say I was out of control per se, just your, your regular kid, you know, uh, blocking out here and there uh, at parties, n nothing crazy. Uh, never drank during the week, uh, never did drugs in, in high school, um, university, um, again, of finding my identity, I, I found that I had created this, this character where I was call it, you know, the, or I thought it was like the life of the party, somebody who, you know, got people excited, was very animated social events, right. People coming over. Like I would, I would always find myself standing on a table, making a speech, 
um, you know, at some point in the night, uh, being very inappropriate, saying things very inappropriate, like very, you know, just kind of like a cocky, cocky kid. That's how I was. And um, so that was kind of university. And then when I finished school, moved back home for a year, saving money, working full time, and then ended up moving out, getting my own place uh, downtown is when I I started or I got introduced to drugs, got introduced to cocaine. And um, that's when things like really took a turn for me. That's when that's when like I, I started struggling like, a, you know, a lot more. Again, same thing. I never, never drank during the week unless there was a social, a big event, a big uh, yeah, company event, work event or a big, um, you know, a, a big party or something on like a Thursday or Friday night. But I never drank during the week, never used drugs during the week. But when that weekend would come, I felt like I worked so hard all week. You know, I had a corporate job um, in tech sales, a global company, same company for 13 years. Also had my real estate license. So I was hustling, selling real estate on the weekends after work. I was working some weeks, 70, 80 hours a week, making really good money, great career, and I just felt like I deserved it. Like I deserved to let loose and to just have a good time because I work my ass off. So that's what I did. I, I, I thought, hey, this is what you do. You grind it out. And when you have a window to celebrate or a window to you know, let your hair down a bit, I'm just going to go 110% like everything else I do in my life. And I just, you know, partied really hard. Never wanted the party to end. I would go sometimes 48 hours straight without mm. sleep, partying, you know, after hours, uh, a house part, like just all over the place. And, um, and then I'd show up at work on Monday. You know, I always found a way to show up to work on Monday, even if I had very little sleep, showed up to work. No one in the office knew I was really struggling because I was a good performer. I was in sales, you know, uh, so nobody really questioned too much. And um, that was my life for, that was my life for a good five years, four or five years. And I knew kind of near the end that um, that it just wasn't sustainable, like something was going to happen because I was putting myself in really uh, tough situations uh, that I'm not proud of. Um, you know, my girlfriend at the time, we were, we were fighting a lot about that, who now, by the way, became my wife. Mm. Um, so half of our time together, uh, I was struggling with drugs and alcohol. That's, that's definitely, I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. Mm. But um so yeah, I was struggling. I was struggling for sure. I, I, I you know, from the outside, I, I looked okay, but on the inside, I was, uh, I was struggling. I wasn't happy, and uh, so I knew I, I needed help. So I, um, I started doing uh, therapy. Right, I had good benefits with my company, so I started doing therapy uh, to, you know, control or moderate my drinking because uh, it just, you know, it was getting out of control some nights. So that's what we did for a while. We were, we were working on moderating my drinking, you know, to, you know, mix in waters between drinks or every other drink, uh, drink on a full, like drink on a full stomach. Very like, I'm surprised how common sense so much of this stuff was like writing down how I was feeling before a night kind of, you know, trying to predict when I think, it, it, you know, after maybe the third drink, things would get a little like very, very basic stuff. So we did that and it wasn't working like it would work, but not all the time. And then I went to see someone else, another therapist. Um, this was 2016, December, the, the year I got sober. After a tough night, I, I, f I woke up the next day, felt miserable again. I just kept I saying to myself, like, look, this isn't working. Like, what you're doing here, it's, it's just not working. So just very vulnerable and just feeling really bad about myself. I went online, uh, found another therapist. And within two hours, I was able to get in and see him. It was December 27th, and it was like in between Christmas and New Year's. And I don't know what this uh, therapist was doing working, but uh, but he was working. And I saw him within two hours of mailing him. And then once we sat down, kind of filled him in what's going on, just was very open. And he just looked at me and said, Luke, you can never drink again. And I was, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe. It. So I was debating him. I was like, no, what do you mean? Not, not drink again. Like I'm half Italian, half French Canadian. Like that, that's like, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Mm -hmm. And 
I was debating him in the moment for the rest of the meeting that I went back to my car after that meeting and I just couldn't stop crying. Like I was just, just mm -hmm. sobbing so much because I knew what he was saying was, was true. Like there was something there. Yeah. And that was for the first time in my life. No one had ever talked to me like that. None of my mm -hmm. other therapists, not my girlfriend, not my parents, not my wife uh, or my friends, nobody. And, um, it was, it was just such an incredible moment, not only the way he spoke to me, but like the, where I was in my life, like that I had done all these things. And, you know, if, if I had that conversation with him, maybe a year earlier, or two years earlier, I probably would have laughed in his face kind of thing and just kind of carried on. But mm -hmm. because I had, you know, kind of screwed up enough to know that things needed to change. Like I was, I was ready, you know, I was ready yeah. to hear that. It was like perfect yeah. timing in my life. Mm -hmm. So once, once I had that experience and then I went back the next time and he's like, look, I'm going to suggest you do group therapy. So you put me into uh, cam H, which is center of addiction and mental health, just mm -hmm. downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. And he put me into this group therapy uh, with people who were pretty advanced with, uh, with, 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 um, with drugs actually. Um, and, um, that was a very, that was a very grounding experience, very humbling experience to be there. And I kind of saw what I needed to see. And I just knew that this was the trajectory I was on. Everyone, in, like people in the room, you know, nobody had a, a cell phone because at one point I was talking about, you know, best practice, what I do, what people were doing to, you know, stay sober, um, or work on it is I, I said that I downloaded this app to keep track of my days and like everyone looked at me in the room, like I was crazy. Like you have a phone. And I just knew in that moment that like, wow, that this like, Luke, don't, don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. Okay. Yeah. You have, you, you, you never lost your job, you know, but like this could be you if you mm -hmm. continue. And I just saw what I needed to see. Mm -hmm. And then that's when the journey started. That's when I was like, okay, yeah. Luke, we're going to give this thing a try. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're just gonna, we're just going to do it. Like, one day at a time. And uh, that's exactly what I did. And here we are. Yeah. Amazing story, man. Thanks. All well, some really important details in there, you know, the group therapy aspect of it. First thing that jumps out to me is like you say, and it, it is so, um, so much a part of, of my recovery story and, and some of the other folks that I've heard as well is there is like this recipe of like, you know what I mean? Like you said, the timing of everything and this person, had they not emailed you back and had you not talked to them two hours after you emailed them, which in between Christmas, which a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of professionals take that week off. Right. So just like one of those things, do you believe in that sort of thing? Like the synchronicity of the universe or like a, you know, a higher power, like what is your take on that as far as like all those things to come into play for you? I absolutely think that was the universe giving me an opportunity, lending me a hand. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I absolutely view it like that. It was my chance. It was my second chance that, that, right. uh, that was coming my way, but it was on me to take it, right? right? It's on me to take it just because the universe is sending you a message. Doesn't mean that like, that's going to be the path. I had to make that yeah. still a conscious decision. I had to be intentional. Yeah. So, um, I give myself a lot of credit too. It wasn't just the universe and it just wasn't just a special man, who um, like, you know, did, did that for me. It was also me who showed up for myself because that is the hardest part is showing up for yourself. Mm. Like just showing up because, mm. you know, maybe we believe we don't deserve it. We don't need it. Uh, we're better, you know, but like just being humble enough to say, I need help. And like actually following through with that mm. says so much about a person. So I was that person. And that's like my, that took a lot of strength. Cause it, it, my ego as a man could have been like, no, I don't, I, it's not that bad or I can figure it out. Yeah. But I, yeah. so I give myself a ton of credit. I mean, at first I didn't, but now looking back and that's part mm. of my recovery, it's like all the shitty stuff that happened in my life, the stuff that I would never talk about again, the stuff that, you know, just buried inside, inside somewhere. All of that stuff needed to happen. Each and every single thing needed to happen the way it did because it brought me to where I am today. Mm -hmm. And like, look, I never killed anybody. I never went to jail. It could have been way worse, right? And mm -hmm. there's a ton of people 
that that have seen much worse and lived much worse. You know, they're in the hospital, they're on life support, like all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I just give those people so much credit, like the strength and resilience it takes to come back from something like that. And I'm like, I'm friends with so many of those people, and they're just like the, their 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 outlook on life and their how how they can just turn that around from losing so much. It's it's like so so inspiring. But for me, I I never really related to that too much because I felt like I hadn't lost everything. I hadn't, um, you know, you know, I I didn't struggle from the outside that much. So I I was easy, easily to like make excuses for my drinking. Right. Hey, I got Mm. this job. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. So it's easy to kind of let it go. But now looking back, it's like I can't even compare myself today to how it was before. Like, like I can't even compare. I've yeah. grown so much. Yeah. So much more mature. Mm. Um, my up, out, outlook on life, my attitude consistent. I was up and down. It, depending on the day you saw me, I would be like the most energetic person in the world, way more energetic than I am now. But then I would crash and burn a couple of days later. And I would just, I, I couldn't get myself to like talk to anybody because I was like so dark and depressed and felt sorry for myself but now it's like my highs aren't nearly as high and my Mm. lows aren't nearly as low i'm consistent i'm at a point in my life i'm going to be 40 soon beautiful daughter we're talking about having a second like i'm looking to be consistent i'm not Mm. looking to do that peaks and valleys i just want to be consistent i want to feel good i want to feel like i'm just you know i'm just working at my best so that at work in my coaching in my, in my fitness, being a, as a dad, as a husband, as a friend, I'm just showing up for people and I'm not, I'm not disappointing them. I'm not disappointing myself and uh, I'm off my soapbox here, but it, I'm, really happy, <laughs> yeah. I'm really happy with uh, what yeah, things turned out. Absolutely. And one thing that, you know, it's, uh, it's I'd heard from somebody in, uh, you know, and that sh- it shows up like when you're talking about group therapy, support groups, um, just men's groups, women's groups, whatever it may be when you see that spectrum of different folks in different spots in their lives. Um, and it, yeah, somebody mentioned to me, you know, we're like two or three decisions away from being, you know, being that person that did go to jail, being that person that lost it. You know what I mean? So it is like, and then that really reflects yeah. that back to you when you're in that intimate space with these people, isn't it? So I love that. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, you talked about um, a couple of things, you know, before we uh, bring this in for a landing, I said the, uh, the identity side of things as far as like how you identify or how you identified before there was this idea that you know uh you work hard so you get you get to be like you party hard on the weekend or however you identified with yourself that way and, you know how does how is this the word identity show up for you now you i know that you sounds like you choose your words very carefully as far as like you're not necessarily in sobriety because that potentially is like a limitation you're in self-discovery I, I really like that so yeah I just wanted to get your take on what identity is and how it shows up for you as well as how it can show up for other clients how you can help f- people find their own identities yeah identity okay the word identity you're right I'm very deliberate intentional with that word I love that word because what happened was I went through an identity shift um, at five years in my sobriety. It took me five years. It was actually pretty much to the day. So like I mentioned, the beginning, I struggled, right? So what happened was I just continued on like the old Luke, but just not drinking. So I hadn't really picked up other hobbies or passions. Mind you, I did find running two and a half years in, but for the first two years, you know, I was just going through the motions. I just, I was, I was struggling because I put so much identity on being this like fun life of the party person mm-hmm. um, that, you know, when I was in those environments, I wasn't because I wasn't, I wasn't drinking. So I just, that wasn't necessarily, you know, me authentically in the moment. So I struggled a lot because I hadn't made an identity shift. I still carried the same identity as when I was drinking. And that, that just created a huge complex. I just was stressed out that I'm not you know, uh, living up to expectations. I felt, I felt sorry for myself. I was embarrassed about my sobriety. I hated the fact that I was sober. I looked at it like I was weak. Like, Luke, you're sober because you're weak. I hadn't made other friends. I hadn't connected. I felt I, I was really alone. I felt so alone, but then something about when I hit that five year mark. Okay. And, and a big part of what I'm going to say is 
You don't need to hit any milestone to make this identity change, okay? You can do this right away from day one. But for me, it took me five years. It took me five years to get there. And when I hit the anniversary of, of the five, because something, I don't know, the number five, I had just qualified for the Boston Marathon. I was running the, the Boston Marathon that um, that, Oct- that that following October, um, sorry, April, that following April. And I, just something about doing that, you know, working my ass off for that, being five years sober. I was like, like Luke, like, be proud of yourself for a second. Because I had so much shame and I and like, no one, nobody knew I was sober. Nobody. Because hmm. I never ever talked about it. other than my close friends and family nobody knew colleagues in the office nobody knew I was sober huh. so when I hit five years I was like look I think I'm ready to share and let people know so I don't know how else to do it but but like, it's like I'm a zero hundred person as I'm sure you could tell and sure many of us are so it's like yeah. if I'm gonna share I'm gonna do it a hundred percent so the way the only th- way I thought of doing that was to do it on LinkedIn, make it a public post and just like splash, make, make some noise here, like in the mm. corporate environment. So, you know, that's what I did. I made a public post, worked for a big tech company, global company, and it just, it got reshared. Like it just made some noise. And I, in that moment, I was terrified. Didn't know wh- why I was like, I was so scared about doing that, but I felt so free and liberated that moment was such a pivotal moment because I just felt the weight off my shoulders. Cause I kept it all in for so long that it wasn't in anymore. It was like a coming out. Like I, I, I was literally in the sober closet. I was in the sober closet and it, do you know how much, you know how hard that was? Finally, I could just be like, Luke, I'm sober. I'm free. It was so liberating. And just in that moment, forget like, you know, the responses. Cause they were, they were very positive. I just, I, that's when I went through an identity shift. I was like, Luke, you are this person. You are this runner, you know, the sober runner. Uh, you're the sober dad. And I just took so much identity in being this present person. Um, that uh, once I started that, then once I have passion and pride behind my identity of being this sober runner, the sober dad, sober husband, I just have so much pride. And once you have pride behind your identity, you'll friggin' go, you'll fight to death to protect that identity. And it just, and it just, and it just solidifies it so much more when you have pride behind it. So that is the biggest thing. Now, now that I have this pride behind my identity, mm. like I, I will always show up where I really force, like naturally in me, I'm showing up for myself. So, um, like, and, and, you know, to wrap up here on this topic, cause I, like I said, you don't need to, to, to wait to do that. You, you need yeah. to really, you really need to be open-minded here and like mm-hmm. really figure out and, and take a step back and just mm. literally take a step back. And, and, and like, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't, ha- it doesn't happen in a few conversations, but it's really taking appreciation for all that you are, all that you've been through and, and truly working on forgiving yourself and accepting everything that you've done and said, because if you still carry guilt and shame, it's going to be very hard for you to, to have a, a new identity and to shift. You need to, to heal and recover. And, and everyone does that differently. Time is a big friend there. Mm. But, you know, starting staying, saying things like everything needed to happen, you know, I mm-hmm. forgive myself, you know, it makes it makes a big difference at the end. Hell yeah. I love that. One thing that it was, I'm curious as to how it shows up for you, because like when we talk about, you know, pride and, and identity and such. For me, it's been a lot of um, like ego work as well, right? Because for me, pride is like pr- unchecked pride becomes this, you know, pers- persona or this egoic version of myself that, uh, you know, can get me into trouble sometimes and just say things that I it, it are not my true, you know, my truth or my true way of conducting myself. You know, I, I feel a little more separate about, you know, the the people that I'm around and such. So what is your relationship with ego? I definitely you gave a, a one wonderfully articulate, you know, version of identity and, and the pride behind it and such. How does ego show up for you these days? What's your relationship with your ego like? So I feel I've made a, a lot of strides with my ego lately, or lately, the last couple of years, I'd say. Um, I, I don't feel like I, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, I'm really doing a self, you know, evaluation. I feel like I do still struggle a bit with ego like look like look 
first thing I said was I ran 25 kilometers. Like, who gives a shit, Luke? Nobody gives a shit what you ran. Why are you saying a number? So I still feel like I like that was my way to like pump my chest. Like, why? So I still feel like I have a bit of an ego, but I'll tell you, it's come a long friggin' way. A long, 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 long friggin' way. So, you know, and I feel like it's 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 kind of like a men thing. Not all men are the same, mm. but it's like a male thing, I find. Um, and that's when I when I first got into this recovery space, um, got my certification, all that stuff, is I started doing group therapy, hosting group meetings for men, all free. I was doing it like an hour and a half every week, all, all out. Like I did it for six months out of my heart. I just, I just learned so much about myself, but I, but it was only for men. And I only wanted it to be just for men because like you said, like we're talking men have egos. I don't know about you, Matt. I don't know you, mm -hmm. but um, chances are there's an ego somewhere mm -hmm. or you've, or you've come a long way. Chances mm -hmm. are. Um, so I just feel like when, especially when other men are, are together, they can talk more freely, more openly and hear just how maybe how someone has is doing something and the growth they've experienced. It, it, it's just really, it's, it's like a, a unspoken language when men get together and, and talk mm. and, mm -hmm. and, and when you can kind of work on, on your ego and your pride of like, what are you trying to prove? Because ego I find is it's just about, it's really about proving yourself to other people. And like mm. standing strong for other people kind of goes with my people pleasing thing. Yeah. It's like not only your your people please, it's not just pleasing. It's it's like you're setting the tone of who you are and you're trying to you're trying to like sh show off, brag, yeah, make yourself yeah. feel better. That's what it is. You're making yeah. yourself feel better. And and all that stuff like should be coming from yourself, from innately from yourself. Like that's like one of the big things I talk a lot about my clients is like creating that energy. Okay. I'm mm. big on energy and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you're not waiting for other people to lift you up, make you feel good. You're creating that energy for other people. You're smiling to strangers. You're saying, hi, you're waving to a runner, even though they're not waving to you. Mm -hmm. You're creating, you're not, you're not, you're not waiting. You're creating. So I find mm -hmm. that with ego, it's like, don't, don't create for, for, to make yourself look this way, create for both of you, like create for this, you know, env environment to be more, you know, uh, open, more freeing. Mm -hmm. Dude, I love that. That's a really unique take on ego and like relationship with energy and, and um, kind of like a co-creation, right? It's like, you know, you're creating for others. And I think I imagine just the way that you're like, I'm just riffing with you here. I imagine by doing that, it takes you a little bit out of yourself and you're, you're not as like worried about yourself and what your ego and needs are. And you're actually like, yeah, I could see where that would really give you a more of a healthy objective view on, on the energy that you're bringing and, and just turn that back down a little bit too. Totally agree with what you say about men, you know, like you mentioned, like you're running thing. And then for me, it was like, I made a mental note. Well, let's see where I can slide in the fact that I've ran, you know what I mean? So the, 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 that shows up and it's, it's, it's all good, right? It's, it's funny that we can like point, poke fun at it, right? And yeah, that we have the yeah. awareness to be able to say exactly. that. So exactly. yeah, yeah, dude, I love that, man. That was really cool. That was a cool uh, segue there. I wanted to give an opportunity for you to mention, you know, your, the importance of, of being a sober husband, sober father, you know, with your family, you mentioned with your partner, long-term partner that has seen both sides of you, right? The darker days and now has seen you, the man that you've become and continue to be in a consistent manner, as you say, is so important to you. Yeah. Just a little bit of not so much a question. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to mention, you know, what kind of relationship that is and what that means to you these days. Yeah. That, I mean, looking at um, my daughter, at the end of the day, or, or or my wife, it's like, I put my wife through so much stuff. She stood by me kind of every step of the way. My biggest champion. I don't know if I would frankly be here if it wasn't for her. So I owe a lot to her. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been, it's been something else, but I'll, I'll tell you this too, uh, Matt, my wife still drinks. Um, mm. she, she doesn't have a problem with alcohol like I do, right? This is very much my own journey. I mean, mind you, she's, she's not a daily drinker. Like she's not like she's drinking, you know, 
a lot every night, but you know, we were at a wedding uh, the other day and, and she had a great time. She was drinking, she was doing shots at the bar with different friends. And I want her to have a good time and, and to, you know, have fun. And same with my friends, 99% of my friends still drink. So I don't, I don't demonize alcohol. I just know for me, this is my thing. I know who, who, like who I am, that if I have a drink, I mean, it, it, it may be okay. Most nights will be okay. Say seven out of 10 nights will be fine. But there's that three out of 10 where I'll have a, a few too many. And then this beast inside me will come out. Mm -hmm. That is just not worth it. So what I say to myself, because I really want to simplify things. I feel like life's complicated. We overcomplicate a lot of things. I like to say things like, I'm allergic to alcohol. Like I'm allergic. When I see someone drinking on a patio and it's like, ah, that look, you've been sober for a while. You could probably sit with this guy or girl and have a beer, you'll be fine. And then you can go and continue on your day. But it's like, I'm allergic to alcohol. If I was allergic to peanut butter, would I have a little bit of peanut butter because it looks so good? No, I'd be like, that's going to give me a rash and that's going to make me feel like sick. I'm going to need an EpiPen. It's not that I'm not going to have peanut butter. Are you crazy? That's how I look at alcohol. Mm. So, you know, when I simplify it like that, I can, I can say that to a five-year-old and they'll understand I'm allergic. It's yeah. like, oh, you're, yeah, that's not good. Right. Mm. So that's the, you know, that's my journey, my path. And, um, you know, I just feel like, you know, I, I owe, I owe it to myself. And I'm, and I'm like, my why at the beginning was very much like for my, for the, my family, like my, my daughter, I didn't want my kids. I, I didn't want uh, them to struggle because my dad struggled with alcohol a lot. I didn't really touch on that. Mm -hmm. We could do that next time. But mm -hmm. uh, he, yeah. he struggled a lot as an Italian man talking mm -hmm. about ego. He never, yeah. we never talked about it, but, but him and my mom, they fought a lot, um, about his drinking. And I just, I just never wanted to do that for, for, you know, my, my family. So that's, um, became another big, big why for me. Yeah. Some really great insight. You know, I, there is a, so many people like the social aspect I find, you know, that managing emotions is the most recurring theme for myself and, you know, the, the groups and different people that I've been working with. And then secondary, especially in early sobriety is that the social dynamic. And there is to a degree where you can pick and choose your friends to a degree or back off from certain circles of friends for the first year, whatever it may, however it may show up for you. The family thing is always the, the trickiest I find, you know, especially when there is. So I'm really glad to, that you shared that, you know, that some partners that don't have the issues that continue to drink. And it's always, I'm always curious about how that works. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are going through similar things. So I really appreciate you sharing that dynamic and, and how you're just saying, you know, it's like to summarize, like it's your journey. Um, you don't necessarily need to take any of that in of what your friends or your wife are doing. In fact, by you focusing on the fact that it's your journey, you can then allow them to have their own fun and you don't have that like, you know what I mean? You're not getting cross-pollinated with, exactly. with their journey, right? And yeah. you know, it's something that I really been thinking a lot about lately, you know, in sharing so much on social media, on Instagram, pretty much every day, every other day I'm sharing something. It's not us versus them. It's not us. It's not sober versus right. not sober. This is not what this is about. Because when you start with that tone, you're going to um, a lot of people that you're you're going to piss a lot of people off. Because I found that I had the blinders on at some point in this journey. Where I was so passionate, you can tell I'm a very passionate person. That I would just be like, sobriety is the answer. Like this is the because I was so proud. It's like, look, you changed your life. So I was just like, so, but then I, I, I caught myself and I was actually getting some feedback for some really close friends, people I, I, that know me for 25, 30 years. And they were right. Some of the things that I was doing was a bit much and I was creating, I was creating this thing where it was us versus them, but that's not that in my heart, that's not how I am. Mm -hmm. And it's like, when you start saying like things like it's your journey, your path, everyone's different. Who, are, who am I to say someone needs to do this versus that? Like, all I know is that I'm taking care of my shit and that's what's most important to me. Mm. And if you want to continue that way, then you go, go do it. Like, I'm, who am I to tell you what to do? Mm. Um, and I find yeah. that that's, that's, that's helped a lot. And it's like, like I said, 99% of my friends still drink. I'm sure Matt, you know, a lot of our friends still enjoy. And it's like, yeah. I'm at a point now 
where I can be around, I can be at a bar, I can be at a club, I can be at a wedding, I can be on the dance floor. It doesn't bother me. But I'll tell you what bothers me, or, the, where I, or I should say, where I struggle. Mm. Where I struggle is the first 10, 15 minutes of any social gathering. Once the ice has been broken and I've, you know, I've found, you know, found myself, my energy's good, I'm feeling good, I, I can go all night. I can go till two in the morning, no problem. Hmm. But it's the first 10, 15 minutes mm, yeah. when you're kind of breaking that ice, when they're yeah. having that, you know, the cocktail bar and they're having that first drink. Yes. That's where I feel, that's where I've, I, I see yeah. myself like, oh, look, this is, this is still hard. I still yeah. get anxious about the first 15 minutes. When I go to a party, I go to a house yeah. like, and even if it's a dinner party, hmm. when it's the first 10, 15 minutes that I struggle. And then once that's, I get through that, yeah, you know, I, I know that. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a great night, but it's just getting my mind ready for that 15 minutes, like having tricks on yep. what to do. Um, yep. It helps me a lot. Yeah, for sure. That's a great insight. And that it's so relatable, especially like I had similar reasons for my drinking, you know, the social aspect, I was very um, nervous in front of even small groups of people that I knew. And still to this day, that's echoed into my adulthood. I'm still like, I'm aware of it, obviously I've been doing some work on it, but yeah, that's great advice, you know, and I, you're talking very much being in tune with energy. There sure is that energy, isn't there? That first 10 minutes, everybody's kind of sizing each other up, especially back yep. in the drinking days. Yeah, there's like the awkwardity until there's a couple drinks down the hatch and then everybody starts yep. mingling a bit. Right. So I totally yep. get that when you're explaining that I was kind of feeling that energy. So yeah, yeah, yep. great advice. Um, You know, I will, yeah, want to be respectful from your time, but I do want to get into you. You mentioned what are some of the, those trips, a trick, easy for me to say, tips and tricks for that first 10, 15 minutes. What are you focusing on when you go to like a pub or a house party for those first 10, 15 minutes? You'll have to, you'll have to work with me as a, as a client. Cause I Ooh. really get into the, I have a whole session. Oh, very cool. Because very cool. this is very much like what, how I was, yeah. how I relate to. So actually I, I'll, I'll share one thing. Okay. Sure, I'll sure. share one thing is when I'm in this environment where it's like, I don't like, I still feel a little bit awkward and I just like feel like I don't know how to like what to, what to say you know I'm trying to be funny and I'm maybe forcing it and all these things when I'm in my head at the end of the day that's what I am I'm in my head mm. I'm overthinking everything and I just mm -hmm. and I just feel awkward because they're like super fun and confident I'm just struggling to get there right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what I do is I just ask good questions ah. I get people to talk People love talking about themselves. You go somewhere and you make a genuine compliment. Like, like again, you can't, you can't say this, this stuff out of your ass. You got to be genuine. Like, wow, you look, you look really good. I'm really like, you look, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Tell me, are, are you been working yet? Like if you get people, you acknowledge something and you get them to talk about it. Or like if they got like these cool new shoes on and you actually like the shoes, it's like, I really like those shoes. Get them to talk. Don't talk. Get them to talk and then mm. ask a really good follow-up question. Yeah. A really thoughtful follow-up question. And then once they're talking, they're not in they're not thinking about you. You're not drinking. Why aren't you drinking? Mm. Oh boy, he looks awkward. He's standing weird. He, yeah, I can tell he's sober. They're not there at all. They are just talking about things they like to talk about. And then confidence, my confidence rises in that moment. And once my confidence rises, it could be in one conversation. Now it's like, Luke, you got this thing, man. You look good. I feel good. And, and I'm a great, and I'm a great, I ask great questions. And then mm. once the night kind of carries on, then it's like, I'm so natural and myself that I'm not even in my head at all. And when I'm not in my head, I'm my best. Yeah. Awesome, dude. I love that. I love that. Couple of quick questions for you, just running related before I get you. Uh, we'll give you the opportunity to, you know, see where people can reach out to you online. I'm just curious, like, what is, uh, first off, what is the longest that you've ran? Here we, we're getting back into ego stuff, but uh, what is yeah. the longest, uh, you know, marathon that you've done or beyond marathon? So my longest run is a marathon, which is 42.2 kilometers, 26.2 miles. Um, so that's my longest run. I've never nice. it, like in training, you never, I, I never run more than that. I've actually gotcha. never ran more than, uh, about three, about three kilometers short of that. It was my longest run until the race. Oh, okay. 
So you don't want to, you don't want to run too much more than you need to. Yeah. Um, but, um, so 42, 42.2 kilometers is a marathon. I've done that a few times. Yeah. And then I think my goal is to, to, you know, run all the world majors, uh, mm. the major marathons. So cool. I've already done Boston. I'm doing Chicago in October. So that'll be two of the six. And then there's Berlin, London, New York, um, uh, and Tokyo. Oh, crazy. So, okay. I didn't yeah. Know Tokyo so was I, you know, I'd love to do all of those. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the goal. And then I think after that, we'll see how things go. If my knees and body's okay, knock on wood, <laughs> I've been pretty good so far would be to get into ultras. And that's where it's like, yeah, ultras okay. anything more than a marathon. Yeah. All so right. I met a, I met a guy at a race um, a few weeks ago who was tr training for a hundred mile run, 160 kilometers <laughs> in like 38 hours or something Man, crazy like that. That is, crazy. and I was like, that's really cool. I can yeah. see myself doing that. One day. <laughs> Perfect. You answered the next follow-up questions. I'm like, are, are you interested in doing, yeah. Like one of those, like as a death race or something, it's all in like that yeah. high altitude and so forth. And yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, I was going to ask you what your, um, you know, some of your future plans. So that's really cool that there's those six and you got the Chicago coming up in October. Yeah. Final question. Uh, just you're, you're a Toronto guy there. What is like your favorite, you know, uh, running circuit in and around Toronto? There are, Toronto has so many amazing running paths and trails, so many runners, like so the community of runners in, in the city here is just unbelievable. Cool. Some of the, the most positive, uh, it's sure that's like every city runners in general, I got to yeah. say runners yeah. in general, just really upbeat, positive kind of people. It doesn't matter how far, how fast it's just, yeah. you got your shoes on and you're running. Super, it's great. Yeah. But I really like running the, the waterfront we call oh. Martin Goodman trail. It's a trail that okay. goes just along the water. Cool. Um, and it's like, you know, downtown. So you got like the CN tower yeah. and all the big buildings and you're on the water and it's like in the summer, nice breeze coming off the water. Beautiful. And it's just, it's just a nice fun spot to be. That sounds like it. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much for coming on today, Luke. Where is the, uh, where are you most commonly found? Or if somebody wanted to reach out to you about your coaching, whether it's running or sobriety or both, what's yeah, the easiest so way to get a hold of you? My Instagram name or handle is marathon to sobriety like the number two um my wife helped me come up with that it's like sobriety is a marathon there's no like shortcuts it's literally one day at a time very much like running and training there's no shortcuts in marathon training either you you show up every day yeah. or yeah. whatever your plan calls for it um i'm also like if you check out my website www.marathon to sobriety.ca you know, the Canadian, right. Um, <laughs> dot CA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you'll see, you know, a bit more about me, you know, kind of my philosophies on coaching and um, you know, some testimonials from clients I've worked with. Um, and, and that's a good way to kind of see, see a little bit more what I'm about. Um, but if you also um, sign up for my newsletter and I mm. promise I won't in, uh, overload your inbox. I send you some <laughs> once every, once every couple of weeks, is you can get you can sign up and get my free guide. I put together a guide on how to be the life of the party sober. Ooh. Put together like a 12, 12 slide uh, PDF because that was me, right? I wanted so bad for people to like me in my drinking days. So now that I'm sober, it's like I created this like thing. It's like your your mindset and just a bunch of things going into a party sober to to still have fun to to you know to feel like you're still fitting in with everyone else still on your own path and journey don't get me wrong but you're just you're feeling com you're feeling confident to be able to go in that environment so you can get that for free on my uh from my website and i'll be off your newsletter i'll be signing up for that right away here yeah. uh that's such a great it's such a timely thing you know as we're heading into it well, canadian spring and summer you know people are coming out of hibernation i'm up in northern alberta so we're we still got some snow we're, we're dealing with but you know <laughs> coming out of hibernation so i think it's perfect timing that you have that available so luke thank you so much for coming on the show i'd love to have you back on after you do the uh that october uh chicago marathon be rad to be a yeah. really cool spot that's to do a check checkpoint for his part two if you're interested yeah that sounds great matt you're uh you're an easy guy to talk to you're doing great things and Thanks for giving me, uh, you know, a voice here and all your other guests and your listeners a chance to kind of like tune in to, you know, you know what other people are doing, because that's what it's all about, right? So kind of listening, everyone's story is different and, every, you know, you maybe got maybe 
one tenth of what I talked about. If you can get one thing, then I'm just, it was worth my time, right? Totally. Matt, yeah. it was worth your time. That's what it's about. Totally. Thanks so much, Luke. We'll talk to you down the road. Thanks, Matt.